without further ado, let me uh, introduce Ozan um, for today's uh, instigation. Uh, he'll have a, a presentation for us and, and provoke some, uh, um, I, I guess, a new perspective or a different perspective into uh, thinking uh, about fire. Um, and we are very excited and happy to have him here. Uh, he's a human geographer uh, based uh, in Berlin uh, in our technician uh, technician where state. Uh, he has two books, um, Animals in the Recent History of Turkey uh, and uh, Talking Through Tales, a storytelling guide. Uh, we actually um, know Zan uh, since 2020. Uh, 2020, uh, this was when actually we uh, had expanded our um, local residencies uh, into a global uh, presence uh, online when everybody was kind of um, stuck in, in COVID in, in their homes. Uh, we uh, turned uh, to our online global community and, and started um, our some, some webinars uh, to uh, expand again the topic of the year that was uh, animals uh, and expanded to, to the idea of coexistence. And uh, Ozan was one of our speakers in, in one of those uh, webinars back then. And he remained um, an engaged figure uh, over the time. And uh, he is now also one of our authors in, in our upcoming book. So um, yeah, let me uh, turn the word to you, Ozan, and maybe you can say a few more words about yourself and then start when you're ready. <clears throat> thank you very much, all, and that's lovely to be here, and thank you for the kind invitation to all of you. I'm looking forward to meet some of you in the summer as <laughs> soon as possible. Well, thank you, Asla, also for the introduction. I mean, maybe I can add something about what, I, what am I and what what am I doing and all that stuff at the end. And part of my talk also includes parts of my life. So maybe I should start with the talk right away. And then we discuss together about also where we stand in this setting. So if you allow me, like I want to start with some subjective personal remarks. Lately, I have this uh, anxiety which burns me lately and sometimes my anxieties flare up and I struggle to contain them I'm thinking about the reasons behind this and I'll explain now but it's difficult to pinpoint exactly but still a few reasons come to mind and they'll impact my life directly here is one it's like a fire burning inside me fueled by the climate crisis and ecology I'm studying and teaching about them, and they are not doing me any good. I don't want to depress you, but here are a few indicators which you may already know. Since 1995, carbon emissions have increased by 70%. We haven't been able to contain it. In fact, Shell, the corporation, predicts 38% increase in profits by uh, uh, 2030, and Exxon, Exxon 35%. Every wildfire leaves a trail of destruction, adding to our carbon emissions. All trees, carbon storage centers of the forest are cut and replaced by plantations to be cut again. Disposable pieces of furniture contribute to carbon emissions stored over hundreds of years. We are stoking the flames of extractivism, burning the world. Second issue that triggers my anxieties is wars. Not much to say here. We are burning the world. And there is a third reason behind the anxieties I feel. This one also impacts my life directly. It's a process that forced me to move away from Turkey, my home country. I tried and sentenced for 15 months. My partner lost his job. We moved. Immigration, a new country, Germany. This is very personal, I know, but as in any personal story, it's possible to follow the traces of a larger context. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their jobs, had their passports seized, were isolated, imprisoned without any judicial process, along with us. Hell, fire, and brimstone. 
If you want to put it in, in a broader context, let's say the increase of authoritarianism or the mafia state. A parallel transformation is happening in many places, Belarus, Turkmenistan, the Philippines, Hungary, India, the USA. Despotic leaders are fanning the flames of authoritarianism. The value system is changing. Allow me to be a bit provocative, provocative here. Democracies based on the Western model, ideas, ideas like human rights are no longer as powerful as they used to be. They do not fire up people. Maybe because we no longer believe that every country will eventually achieve Western standards. The promises of development are now seen more as hypocrisy. It no longer serves as a compass. Was there though such a period before? Speculative again, but I think there was. Especially after the 19th century, the idea of progress gradually spread to many different geographies. Especially think about the post-World post War II period. There was a kind of hope spreading worldwide, a way out to liberation. Anti-colonial movements, anti-colonial movements succeeded. New anti-imperialist independent states were being established, especially in Africa. There was a belief that every place had the potential to develop, to democratize. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is adopted, civil rights movements, strikes in feminist queer movements of the 20th century. Not perfect, but there was hope. There are also more concrete things. For example, food production has increased exponentially. For the first time, hunger was not a problem for the majority of the population. We don't need to talk about developments in medicine, brand new technologies, new communication devices, radio, television, telephone. Humans landed on the moon. A very symbolic moment, watch from all over the world. There was not just a rocket there, there was a promise, a brand new horizon. Humanity was moving forward, a sentiment, fire in the belly. Today, we have artificial intelligence or genetic technologies. They are told more as horror stories than hopeful beginnings. Internet, the promise of free, accessible knowledge, was soon colonized by corporations, trolls, propaganda bots, and surveillance technologies, more depressing than hopeful. I'm not saying everything was better 50 years ago, by the way. Don't get me wrong. What I mean is this. There was a promise. That's it. Accordingly, if grandmothers or grandmothers own three pairs of shoes, grandchildren could possess 30. They would surpass the education level of the previous generation and enjoy a more luxurious lifestyle, overflowing fridges, hot water, an array of electrical appliances, automobiles, and so forth. Abundance will proliferate, rendering life ever more splendid. This era is aptly called as carbon combustion complex, or the era of rate acceleration. Yet, we may have reached a turning point in abundance where the true costs of appropriation, pre previously deferred to future times and other people, start to manifest themselves as ecological vulnerabilities. Perhaps it would be more apt to refer to this not as an economy of growth, but rather as a suicide economy. Previous generations spent resources as, as if there was no tomorrow, yet their tomorrow is our today, or civilization is burning inside. So now let me get to my main point. In the face of such a world, what are our responses? What is our political repertoire? What kind of futures do we imagine? Firstly, a small observation. If you have Netflix or a similar platform, search for dystopia or dystopian. See how many movies or series come up. A lot. You probably have several more in mind right now. Apocalyptic narratives are not new at all. People have believed that the end of the world is near for the last 3,000 years at least. Yet, there has been an explosion, explosion of dystopia in recent times. So, my question is, what happened to utopia? As if they are extinguished. Actually, until recently, utopias were there, predominant, or as dominant as the dystopias. The colonial period, especially after the late 18th century, was dominated by utopias. Until the 19th century, men, usually men, would sit down and write utopias. Utopias about noble savages, socialist utopias, 
Enlightenment utopias. If they were written today, they would probably be dismissed for valid reasons, by the way. They would be seen as naive, absurd. Too much utopia leads to the way leads the way to totalitarianism. The 20th century really passed with the darkness of utopias, communism, fascism, the negligence of the European Enlightenment for the rest of the world. It is so hard to be convinced by such dreams anymore. On one level, it's quite understandable. But my question is this, what came in its place? For Ernst Bloch, utopias are the most important remedies against alienation. Societies without utopias, societies without a common orientation or big goals, easily become atomized. They melt in the heat. By the way, utopias haven't completely disappeared, don't get me wrong again. I want to emphasize that too. For, for example, neo-Nazis in Germany, the country where I'm living right now, are keeping their utopias alive. Yet especially in the left of the political spectrum, we are preoccupied with deconstruction. Utopias are naive, they are passé. I guess this has a price too. What do we want? What is our vision beyond reactive demands and superficial wishes, wishful thinking? Democracy, human rights, respect for different identities, all borrowed from the movements of the previous century. I repeat, we need to keep them. But comprehensive, programmatic, radical visions are very much marginalized. They are way too utopian. This also creates a very favorable climate for marginal racist movements, conspiracy theories, or indifference. So to provoke, uh, provoke us here a little, there is 9 to 5 accelerated civic work, NGO work, but no theory militancy. There are grant applications, funding applications, but no autonomy. There is entrepreneurial academia, but no radical thinking. There are social responsibility projects, but no revolutions. Revolutions are out of fashion. There is no programmatic vision to be put forward against private property, the financial system, the nation state, the invisible of care labor, systemic unemployment, or against ever-growing economies. We have plenty of doomsday scenarios, but we don't have a utopia that will give us the courage to put this one in flames. Thank you. That was it. Short but. Thank you so much. That was um, very thought-provoking, to be sure. Um, I I almost feel like when you were talking about um, that utopias kind of lead to the totalitarianism, total, totalitarianism it, it almost feels like it's not a, a spectrum from side to side, but a spectrum that is like once you get so far over to one side, it actually loops back around to the other, the other way. Yeah, I completely agree. So keeping that tension, I mean, utopias, believing in one utopia and taking it as the norm, as the only solution that could easily become totalitarian. So how can we come up with utopias, a horizon, a, a kind of binding element, but then also be very critical of it all the time? And that's the issue of politics. Absolutely. Um, so I, I do want to open this up for a conversation with everybody. So the best way to do this would be if you want to raise your hands um, and we can have you come off on mute and ask your questions live. Um, in the meantime, it looks like Ilaria put some questions in the chat. She said, what kind of future do we imagine? What happened to utopias and what came in their places? Just highlighting some of the points you were making as you were making. So that's uh, that, that, that's. Uh a way to keep some notes going, <laughs> mostly. So I, I want to let it open to, and if you are shy or you cannot talk because this, the house is quiet where you are, you are welcome also to write it on the chat. We can multitask reading. Yeah, this is Deborah Weintraub. I'm from Los Angeles. Um, I was on your talk is provocative. Your anxiety is shared. Um, but when you, um, I think you're suggesting that revolution or some form of utopian revolution might be the response. I, I, I wonder if even historically how, um, <sighs> How inefficient in a way that was in, in, in generating change. If I guess I wonder about your vision about um, generating change. How do you really see change happening? Well, that is a perspective, matter of perspective, I would say. Most changes that has happened until now actually happened through utopian thinking, like the 19th century worker movements, anarchist movements, communist movements, feminist movements, anti-colonial movements, they have an utopia. So maybe, and that's a provocative again, like, okay, if this kind of being critical all the time about all utopian, but left up and ended up with nothing is the exception, not the norm. So, and I'm not sure to what extent it generates, uh, say, politically informed transformation. There is transformation all the time, obviously, but we are not really sure where we are heading to because we don't have this common horizon. So to what extent it generated change, I would say it's a matter of perspective from where you see it. I was just saying, thank you. Um, so your, your real your real point is that it's a utopian thinking that's not happening right now. And exactly what, what that generates is, is unclear, but there isn't specu enough speculation is what I hear you saying. Maybe we discarded the utopian thinking with all the benefits that, that it contains. That's what I'm saying. We need theory social movements that are angry, that are that have a vision, that wants to change the world and presents real solutions. Like this is what we imagine the world to be. That is missing, yes. Okay. Yeah, what, what I was uh, reading also is the, the, keeping the criticality, the critical thinking, right, as, a, as an important aspect of how to to look at the future with, with this critical eye also and elaborating something that is not just a regurgitation of what it is given to us, but have um, 
the, the question for me then becomes the complexity that we have built and the interconnectedness. I think what is new, newer to some of the utopias of the past is that the world is one one today. We know about what is happening in a faraway place in real time, and we have a much more difficult um, time to understand what is our culture and what are the differences between our culture and another culture, and therefore the reactions we have locally may be different than the global ones and how they interface. So the, the utopian actions have also this kind of global vision that becomes very complex for a single mind to come around it and to grasp it. So what is good locally might not be good globally and vice versa, et cetera. So people feel like it's too complex. I'm giving up. I'm just listening to some music and, so, music. and instead of being revolutionary, I accept it and I flow with it. Um, but not that it's correct, but how can we revitalize that energy perhaps is the, is the question also, or is the thought. Exactly. So don't, I mean, to make my point more clear, I'm not defending that we should come up with the utopia and subscribe to it without any critical thought and etc. We passed that and which is good. But how can we come back to the energy that it unleashes? So how can we revitalize this, this transformative powers of it? Because yeah. the option is cynicism, nihilism, and all these kind of, you know, dead ends. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, yeah um, shall I read? Uh, because Andrea yeah. says that he has, uh, he has a call, so he wanted to keep his voice uh, to himself. Uh, but uh, what he was wondering about was if Ozan or uh, any of us in the group have any reflections on the prevalence of the term resilience in our current age. Has resilience replaced utopia as ecology and climate change are concerned? Uh, and how do how do the terms differ? Uh, and what roles to, do they play in this conversation, if any? So if utopia, today's utopia is, um, is resilience, um, I think is, is the question. I mean, I can jump in, but I wait for Yes, please. Yeah, that, that was uh, the end of uh, Andrea's question. I mean, I can I can sure. give my thoughts and then we can open it up to us. Um, so I'm a, I'm a biomimic, which basically means that I study nature's patterns um, to help figure out design templates to solve human challenges. And one of the things that we talk about with res with regard to resilience is resil resilience is a reaction to um, disturbance, right? Sometimes disaster, right? Um, and for resilience in nature, we see three things. We see decentralization, um, we see diversity, and we see duplication. So if the, the smaller uh, solutions that we have laid out are aligned with those things, or I guess not necessarily aligned, but decentralized um, with those things. Um, it provides more resilience when there is disturbance. Um, and I feel like with disturbance, it's really the things that are out of our control. Um, but being an individual human or even an individual community or an individual country, there is, it's not just nature that is beyond our control, but it is also other human communities that um, may impact us in certain ways and that we may impact those other communities in certain ways. Um, and so I think it's, it's an interesting thing to think about of resilience versus utopia. But I feel like there was probably always a resilience piece. Uh, we may not have used that language back then, um, but I almost feel like resilience is the perspective of like utopia is never like, Hmm. Nature and life is a dynamic non-equilibrium, right? It's always changing and moving. We may want to get it to the perfect center, which might be utopia, but even if it got there for just one second, it would immediately move off of that space. Yeah. Um, and so that idea of um, resilience to be able to try to keep it at least closer to the center of that utopian target, I think is um, is what I think about when I think about resilience. Yeah, and there is another comment. Z Sarina says, and doesn't res resilience touch on reverting to a past condition rather than one that is utopian or hasn't yet been realized? Exactly, going on, I would say. So they are different in scope. I, that, that's that one regards to the future, the other one regards to the present time slash past, like resilience, keeping this existence as such, and except making it more resilient, but it doesn't really turn into a programmatic transformation with regard to bigger things. It doesn't have a bigger voice in that regard, with regard to nation states, financial system, what kind of societies do we want, and etc. So how can we expand that program, maybe starting with resilience, to these bigger issues as well? And don't, again, like I'm making these disclaimers all the time, I know the dangers of speaking big, making these big statements. There has been a long and terrible and horrifying history of it, making these big statements. And it is too male-dominated, white-centric, and white thinking, I know all these burdens. But I really want to also think critically about our own position, stepping out of all these kind of narrative conventions. What did we end up? Where did we end up? This is my question. That bothers me, in a way. And can I make another contribution to that, the language change? It is so, I, I invited, I, I'm teaching this class about social norms here in Germany, and invited a person uh, from West Sahara, I don't know, you know the situation, the last colonized country of Africa, uh, by Morocco. And she came and she said, don't call me an activist. I'm a militant. We are militants. This is the word, word used in 1970s or so. Activism somehow near and it connotes something else. Even the scope of activism is different from the militancy. Militancy now has bad connotations, military, violence, gun, da, da, da. activism, something else though. Again, we need to be very critical, funded to begin with most of the activism. So we really need to also take or how to pay attention to these changes in language. How do we imagine the world and which language do we use in doing this imagining? Absolutely. Uh, Serena, you want to come off mute and uh, make a comment? Sure. Can folks hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Ozan, I just wanted to validate too what you were saying because I work with historically disinvested communities, specifically in California, but um, we're doing an exercise right now with a community in the San Francisco area where we, how do you see your community 20 years into the future? And we struggled to get answers because people had a hard time even being able to conceptualize how things could be dreamed of. That was really painful <laughs> as a group for us to facilitate. We actually had to figure out a different way to go about it because we were getting, um, people were not able to think five years into the future because they were all the barriers and how it might be. Yeah. Yeah. And that was super disheartening. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a very real thing. Sarina, a little bit. You're breaking up. Okay. okay. You can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. And we got the, you've got the main oh. point, by the way. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to like I'll, I'll speak a little bit slower and I'll maybe I will break up continuously, but I just think Ozan because um, communities are struggling to think past uh, a two to five year condition and that utopian ideal is harder for people to grasp and realize. Absolutely. Ozan, do you want to make a comment about that? Mm, perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, but I wonder why. Why are people struggling to think beyond two to five years? What really is? Why is it so hard to imagine a different future? There is a lack of hope. 
there is a lack of, um, in terms of tangibility, things don't seem possible. For example, I'm working on a social equity framework for a community, and we're going across many different topics. They are struggling to figure out how economic livelihood and uh, well-being can be attained in their community because it's a societal issue, right? Hmm. I wonder also, I, I would see that, Sarina, and I wonder also if it's part of the narrative that needs to, or the educational process of how to engage in conversations um, that help us understand life, not just as a immediate uh, rewarding of the goods you get. If you do A, you get B, but um, to have a vision. So to be more critical and to have a vision as part of even the education system that is not um, so threatening of the immediate economic well-being that people can really look forward. Because again, as I said, 50 years ago was quite different and it was, and we had so much less and yet we could envision. And today we feel threatened often by things that we can't, um, because we cannot have something we feel economically, we are very at risk, but in fact, economically, it's a big generalization I make, but a lot of people have have something that is greater than it used to be, but they don't look back, they don't look at the context, they don't have the tools to look at the context. It's not a, I'm not giving responsibility to the individual, but as a society uh, uh, overall, right, as a whole, that we look at of having, having, having without having a bigger vision that is beyond the physical goods. And that impoverished our way of living as a vision, as a critical thinker, because we are preoccupied of the, you know, the, the tomorrow and not the meaning of life in a way. I don't know, sorry, it's a bit uh, bigger picture. Adita, you had uh, you raised your hand. Hi, um, so I'm calling in from rural West Bengal in India. Um, I am both Indian and Canadian, um, and I've spent more time the last three years uh, in India than I have elsewhere uh, in the world, actually. Um, and there's like two things that come to mind when we're thinking about utopias, um, especially in conditions of uh, political authoritarianism, lack of resources and um, you know, climate collapse. Um, there's you know, the usual things to be said uh, that has already been said about why political utopias are no longer fashionable because various uh, iterations of them have been sort of put into practice and have not yielded in transformation that is lasting. But I also want to kind of point to one structural issue um, that is happening throughout most of the world, most of the industrialized neoliberal world, which um, has a deep influence in how we conceptualize utopias, but also like a more sort of interpersonal cultural issue uh, that, I'll, that I'll get to later. Um, in terms of the structural thing, there's mass NGOification of grassroots movements um, that become like, you know, all of the energy that rises somatically in people, all of the imagination gets co-opted into foundations. And this is kind of you know seen as par for the course because people need money and people need to survive. So those like basic fears of survival are exploited to make the so-called revolution much more watered down than it should be. And um, it's also just like you know it it really collapses a lot of other possibilities because um, as Ozan said, there's a there's you know people are uh, catering to existing structures by thinking of things like grant proposals. Of course, there's very few ways that like these external grants do um, have no strings attached. Like there's few grants in the world that are quite open and quite um, you know. Uh, there's, I wouldn't say they're grants, but like there are sources of money that are less uh, stri strict about the kind of work that you do. Um, but, but yeah, for the most part, we have built up a prestige economy where um, people are uh, valorized and they are, you know, kind of, they, they get something out of being part of these structures while still like retaining a shred of their radical um, tendencies. And that's the compromise that we've all kind of collectively agreed to and adhere to. So of course, um, there's no utopianism because for some people, that is the utopianism and it's been realized and it's been captured. Uh, that's one thing. Um, and the other thing, uh, and this is controversial, but I'm kind of basing this understanding on uh, the ideas that have been put forward by various Black feminists, especially from the US, that there is an aversion to pleasure uh, in its various forms within activist and militant spaces. Uh, there's uh, an overemphasis on, quote unquote, the struggle, whatever that means, um, which is kind of a bummer for everybody involved uh, as part of the revolution. And, you know, this idea that the revolution can may not be comfortable, but it, it could be pleasurable. It could be enlivening is not something that is um, particularly prevalent in global activist circles. It's kind of changing slowly, but, you know, it's outside of very specific Black feminist spaces that speak about uh, the importance of joy and pleasure in everyday organizing practices. Um, this isn't a widespread idea. So those are my like basically two cents. Is that uh, yes, Adrian Marie Brown uh, is, is the person I learned from, as well as Trisha Hersey and her nap ministry, which uh, you know kind of talks about rest. Uh, but yes, you know as much as um, we are uh, interested in revolution and we're interested in radical social change, where a lot of people are working with um, the the logics and the operating modes of the dominant culture, which is about linearity, which is about hustle culture, that does not create the conditions for a joyful transformation that is sustainable uh, beyond the three to five years. And that's all. Thank you. No, I was just going to say, I, I think there's some really mind opening uh, conversation happening here. So I, I'm just really, I'm really grateful that you've all joined and, and that you're speaking, speaking up as well. Um, Ozan, I wonder if um, you could speak to the, do you know about the idea of like high nature, um, high tech and like that, the quadrant of like nature to technology and how sort of like low nature, low tech is sort of um, what we had in the, in the beyond days back in the day when we didn't really have technology. Um, and then we have the uh, low tech. Uh, high nature, which is um, sort of like a libertarian dream of um, sort of independence with like solar panels and um, and then or, or you know very low low tech type of situation. Um, and then there's um, high tech low nature, which is a bit dystopian robot universe. Um, and then high tech high nature is sort of like, I guess the, the utopian option of um, there will be there will be tech in the future probably uh, most likely. And so how can we evolve technology at the same time that we protect and renew nature um, for nature's sake um, and also for humanity's sake? Interesting. I didn't know this matrix, but it makes total sense. But when I, I don't see technology and nature as opposites, like this kind of, because the problem, the way I see it is not the technology per se, it is the old production of certain things, like IKEA furniture, for example, like these things that we have in our homes that we will discard in six months' time. It's not necessarily technology or high technology. We, and for, to me, again, like, I mean, I guess everyone would agree with that technology is not, it's a political 
precision, what do we want and which type of technology? So I'm, I wouldn't be against technology per se because my glasses, my contact lens is also a technology when you think of it. So my point then will address more the economy than technology. So that would be my priority. So what type of production regime do we want and which technologies do we need in this type of need? So it is not necessarily rising technology leads to lower ring of nature and etc. That might be a misleading counterbalance balancing. I want to reinforce and thank also Sabrina, you're running, but uh, everyone that participates, the idea of the salon is that the conversation is not necessarily linear, but it brings in food for thoughts, right? Because we, we just jump in with our thoughts. It's not all a feedback to each other necessarily, but more like fires that we live and each of us can bring in some thoughts and uh, it can be continued, can be dropped, but is uh, the dynamic aspect of it is built in in the, in the vision of the salon also in some forms of them. So thank you for being flexible in the conversation as well. I have, a, I have a question about the, the idea that was raised about pleasure uh, and radicalism, because it's not something that, it's a, that's a thought that I'm not familiar with, and I wonder if whoever spoke about that could expand a bit more on that concept and how, how you embraced it or you encountered it and how it's being used. It may be complementary. There are different traditions saying that actually one would be Emma Goldman, the anarchist feminist woman, that a revolution that I can't pass, I'm paraphrasing, that I can't pass on the screen is not a revolution worth having. So dance, joy, pleasure, all parts of the revolution should be. So that is also part of the utopian thinking for me. It's not necessarily this kind of militant sitting and always talking about the fights that they will have, but also choice of life, embracing each other, compassion, and all these other feelings that should come out should be a pro the programmatic of the utopian thinking, to my mind. Emma Goldman, I can write it down. I think, um, was that when you were making your presentation, if I'm not wrong, you used the verb atomized at some point. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that's somehow uh, the way um, this utopia is also atomized. I think uh, we are against, again, this totalitarian um, force that is upon us, you know, um, around the world, globally. Um, has atomized all this uh, hopeful thinking. It's not like that it's, I think, destroyed it. I think hope comes with uh, being human, with imagination. Um, but I think uh, it got us into these bubbles of uh, mini utopias or mini uh, collectives of, of hope. I think what we're trying to do with NAR is also some, some kind of, uh, you know, a mini utopia, uh, trying to build this collective um, and um, be inclusive of all these different ideas, uh, the diversity, um, but the social diversity that kind of equals to the biodiversity that would make the life uh, ongoing, right? And ongoing in a way that it would not destroy uh, its, its, its parts. Um, so in my, from my personal also perspective, I'm in the country you left uh, and, and still facing all the all this um, uh, all this force and thinking again, the analogy of the fire, we use power as one of its um, important uh, characters. And I think why um, these revolutions uh, don't happen anymore as uh, we would hope them, they, they would, is also, uh, lies also in the imbalance or, of, of where the power um, is located. Um, as you know, like about 10 years ago, we were, we tried or we felt like we were part of a revolution kind of starting in Istanbul uh, during the Gezi protests and um, it, it got atomized again. And, um, and now like if uh, the same actually threat is, is uh, continuing with actually growing um, in its power, uh, I, I cannot think myself as, I don't know, as um, excited anymore to be part of something like uh, a revolution because I know the power against me is, is now uh, much uh, more equipped uh, with fire again. Like, I mean, the, the, the power of the fire that the, the totalitarian regime has against the hopeful uh, activist um, uh, is, is too uh, too high now that uh, I, I have to keep my hopeful uh, collective um, in a bubble almost. And, and we are trying to continue our uh, our lives uh, without giving hope. Uh, but um, it only remains uh, in, in certain bubbles. So I think, again, keeping the analogy of the fire, you know, when the fire starts with this cracking and it's, it's pleasant and um, um, it's, it's not as powerful, uh, but it's, um, as it starts burning more uh, mass, perhaps it um, uh, gets more powerful. And at a certain point, it becomes, it starts becoming destructive, right? It's, it's, it reaches a critical um, point. So my hopeful thinking is that uh, we, we are in our bubbles now, kind of atomized in different parts of the world. Uh, we still are hopeful thinking and hopeful um, activism, like small miniature activisms. Uh, but at one point, I think um, some other type of revolution will emerge or might emerge out of this. Um, it's, it's not going to be, you know, um, the, like the revolutions of, of the past, but I think it will emerge. We may be in a transition right now so that we don't recognize it at the moment, but um, I'm hoping within our lifetimes that uh, we'll see a turn of uh, power and a new story unfolding, perhaps. Yeah. I, I think, think the silence, I guess the silence will break at some point, that there will be something coming up very soon, because I don't know if it's only my feeling, but the, the kind of frustration many people feel at work, at home, at the, against climate crisis, incapacity, the liars. I mean, all these political frustrations are now being mostly channeled to, unfortunately, the right-wing parties. There is a danger to that. Trump comes to power because of that. Also in Germany, IFA is, is, is on the rise. So how can we come up with somehow that would unite or appeal to people a different language? And that's political work. That's what politics mean to me, that creating this language. And to your second point, I guess you are right, by the way. We are all afraid at the same time because these are very violent institutions that we are facing against. But the playing field was never even. Like, it was always squeaked squeak to the powerful against women, against slaves, against... And they had to pay the price at some point. Unfortunately, I'm talking about it as a historical observation. I'm not saying we should pay people lives and etc. But historically, that's what happens. So we shouldn't wait or we can't, we can't afford to wait until the playing field becomes even. That, that doesn't work. Never happened. What you just said, Ozan Dani, is uh, it reminds me of what happened in Russia, right? With the, the death of the only oppos opposition. So that, that, that I feel was the closest to a like a behavior that was of someone that went all the way through us in the revolutions, right? So the fear that Asli is portraying and the courage of this person or whatever. And we don't need to go into specific things, but to, to build the hope also, right? To build to some, someone that has been 
you know, not an isolated human being, but he had a family, he had kids, he had everything that we have, and yet he dedicated to a higher goal that was, you know, important to all of us. So I feel that that if, if nobody else I can think of, of a recent uh, individual to, as an example, is him. Uh, Deborah Aditi is back now. She has been disconnected for a minute. So if you wanted to repropose her, your question to her, even though Ozan has addressed it in a way, but I think it would be nice to include her. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was uh, curious about what you spoke about, Adita, about the Black feminist movement. And um, I mean, I'm familiar with Emma Goldman, who's a historical figure, but I'm curious about her. Well, the current thinking, what, what exactly do you mean by a Black feminist movement that's focused on pleasure, that's revolutionary? Just, I was curious to have you talk about it some more. Uh, sure. So uh, from, from my understanding, uh, this has been part of uh, Black feminist praxis for a long time, um, like in the American context, uh, going back to the time of slavery. Um, but it's only recently been kind of written down and um, interpreted for current circumstances. And one of the people um, that has talked about it the most and probably most well known for it is um, this person who is a mo like she's a, not exactly a movement organizer, but she's a facilitator in movement spaces. Um, her name is Adrian Marie Brown, and she has this book called Pleasure Activism. Um, I'm just putting her name in the chat um, so that others can see. Um, and uh, Along with her, there is uh, Trisha Hersey, um, I think uh, that's how you spell her name, um, who is a theologian um, and has a organization called the Nap Ministry, which talks about the necessity for rest as part of the revolutionary process. Um, and none of these are you know, talking about self-care. And also, of course, there's Audre Lorde, uh, who's talked about self-care as uh, an act of political warfare. Um, but yeah, none of these people are talking about self-care in a way that is disconnected from community. Um, but also, it's, it's sort of talked about in a way where um, you're nourishing yourself, you're nourishing your senses, your body, your mind, uh, so as you're not burnt out through the gradual process of liberation. Um, you know, I've been thinking about it in terms of more on like a, not exactly a political level, but like what human beings need and what conditions create community and thriving. And if you look at a lot of like Republican conventions in the US and right-wing conventions around the world, um, there's a lot of place for honestly luxury um, where that is the ideal that they're going towards. And they're kind of bringing it to the people that are part of these honestly fascist and authoritarian movements. Um, and it makes sense why on a somatic level, people are drawn to it, even though it's wrong. Uh, and within sort of liberatory, emancipatory and revolutionary spaces, the struggle of the present is so much more emphasized than the liberatory communal abundance of the future and the joy that can possibly bring that we identify more with the struggle of the moment instead of the futures that we're kind of calling for. So this isn't, you know, uh, classical political theory by any means, but this is part of the spiritual practices um, that are part of, you know, um, the black feminist tradition going back to Harriet Tubman, who was like, I was born free while she was still enslaved. Uh, that sort of imagination and that sort of practice of hope and joy and abundant kind of thinking is a discipline that needs to be cultivated instead of constantly identifying emotionally with the current levels of uh, toxicity and, you know, disorder and lack of freedom that we are all experiencing as a collective. And, you know, um, in the last six months there, I've been in India, uh, there has been gradual degradation of civil liberties and ongoing, you know, um, ongoing uh, state violence against regular people as well as political dissidents uh, without any real legal framework to challenge it, even though it's like completely illegal. And uh, the thing is that like, yeah, it's, it's really scary to get locked into a somatic free state, but that is not going to be the place from where I draw any answers to get out of this current mess. Um, and that's just how bodies work. Uh, that's just how like, you know, our imagination thrives when we kind of nourish it with the right things that are available to us. And I don't think that's, you know, um, that's not self-indulgent. That's not just survival, but it's actually necessity for future thriving and I, winning. I, I think I have a question. I totally agree. And you said it so much more eloquently that I was trying earlier to make a point that was going in that direction, five years versus the 20, why you, we, we, we are trapped into that. I was wondering if you have an example of how, of someone that, um, kind of portrays the, the positive, the joy, right? The, the not that uh, emphasize more and more the, the fear and going down that path. Well, unfortunately, the present examples I have are from uh, authoritarian movements that were long suppressed that are now succeeding. Uh, in India, the uh, current people in power were made illegal less than 50 years ago. They're, they have been, they were like the pariahs in society, but they kept their faith and now they control pretty much all branches of government and all states and are the biggest like financial block of political power in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's the same stuff with, you know, everything that's happening with the degradation of civil rights and especially reproductive rights in the U.S. Uh, we had, uh, you know, in the U.S. you had like affirmative action. You had Roe versus Wade and these were federal laws, right? That was kind of done. And uh, the people who were against it have been working for 50 years to overturn these things. Clearly, they were doing something to sustain that movement in light of what they perceived as continuous losses. Yeah. And that is, you know, uh, a certain kinds of community care and cultivation of joy in small increments and spaces. Um, and, and like, that's something that we have not really in, in the progressive left radical places been effectively able to really prioritize. Um, and, you know, if I, if I look back into the Indian freedom movement, for example, that was like, a, what, like 200 years long. And of course, it's not exactly the same stuff that we're facing today, but a lot of anti-colonial movements were um, supported by the work of poets and writers and people who made beautiful art. And that was not considered self-indulgent, but inspirational to bring a certain vision of the future forward. Um, and yeah, like we, like honestly, like um, I was living in the UK for a few years uh, in, in London in particular, and um, a lot of the vibes were understandably very depressing within radical circles. <laughs> and you cannot sustain long-term militancy or activism or any kind of work uh, without being plugged into sustainable sources of joy with people that you're trying to bring about changes with. It's just not possible because your body will burn out, your mind and emotions will burn out. Um, and that's not something that I was really understanding when I was always just like, oh, I can't really be part of grassroots movements because um, 
I get really bummed out and I respect the work that they do, but I can't be part of it. And I didn't understand why I was initially so put off by the work of organizing and grassroots change. And then I was like, oh, this is what's really missing. Uh, and if you look at something like corporate culture, which has basically commodified all of the wellness techniques and things from the global south and anti colonial traditions and is now kind of supplying them to people who work nine to five to maintain a sort of like loyalty in the corporate workforce. You can see the way that all of these techniques that did not come from those worlds have been appropriated and is now effective in people, keeping people uh, stuck uh, in the current system. And it's just like, it's just time to take it all back. We are trying a little bit right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think this was very um, helpful to hear your thoughts a little bit more expanded. <laughs> Ozan, what do you think from um, what Adita just responded? I'm curious at your perspective. Well, I was I was thinking a friend of mine has an office, for example, with free food. Every Friday they party, there's a table tennis in the office, and they just reappropriate all these kind of abundance, sharing, community, playing together, joy within the setting of that office so that they can stay there until Friday evening and over the weekend. Completely free. Yet, how can we take it back? Would be my question as well. Well, and I guess my also sort of side question to that is like, uh, not that not that we're looking for a middle ground, but how how can we survive and thrive in a capitalist, a global capital, capitalist regime and not work a nine to five for a corporation that may be providing these things, right? Like, um, is there is there a place for pragmatism um, to be able to like still live our lives and and still also on the side figure out ways to to push towards uh, more utopian times? Adita, you want to come off you and, and speak to it? Yeah, I mean, um, I feel like yeah, that's that's a possibility um, that we haven't really explored yet, uh, and. I kind of sense the change in, like, I'm cautiously optimistic about it, but I feel like, uh, according to many metrics, Google is probably the most uh, employee-friendly workplace in terms of the benefits they provide, but they're also very anti-union and things like that. But, you know, with what's happening in Gaza, it's incredible to see people that were really not plugged into labor movements uh, kind of show up against their bosses and the technologies that they're supplying to enable a genocide. So um, clearly, like, Googlers have the resources and the kind of atmospheres that keep people stuck to a corporate environment. Um, if that can be kind of extended forward and to a wider community, like, I don't, I don't see... I don't see anything impossible. Um, I've worked in the past in uh, contexts which were uh, quote unquote apolitical and had certain kinds of benefits. Um, and that's what like working in those spaces and knowing that I had my own sort of financial security enabled me to spread myself out elsewhere far more um, and be effective. Yeah, I think and it's also for me a portion of, you, you can't unplug yourself, but is you stay plugged, but which is what you're doing also in a way, right? In first person, you are participating into something, but how you then uh, extend your yourself to be doing also things you feel the purpose of life can be about right so it's, it's also also that the change is i mean there is a revolution and there is also the incremental change i would say right that slowly in our lives we can we can improve and, and change priorities within where we can act right or, or with actions that i mean I, I still like the word generosity as you know this, this different attitude that not everything also happens with an economic exchange of money economy is not just equal to money which is what we have boiled it down uh, with the business but it's a much it's a greater means and so you do other things that expand or that's for me that's what it is you know I, i'm part of a system that i might not perfectly like but with, with the critical thinking applying critical criticality to what i do and what i choose to do i can also dedicate at least part of of my time to something else or something that is, is, is better than the, the main line of it um but yeah it's quite difficult to <laughs> i feel like it kind of speaks to that idea of like the purity culture too of like you can't you can't be pragmatic because then you're not purely on the right side of things um and uh i mean there's a lot a lot mixed up into that but yeah go ahead were you gonna say something? No. Um, but just, yeah, I think it's it's interesting because, well, that question of revolution versus incremental, right? Um, of like, is it successional or is it a wildfire that changes so drastically that it, there isn't a, a, a past to go back to? Kind of like before and after COVID, we can't go back to what life was like before COVID, right? Um, and so it's it's really this question of how does nature even really, or how does life deal with major change? Um, and but also how can we emulate those systems, right? Like I, I kind of think about the bees and how bees, when they um, they have enough of a population to build a secondary hive, they um, go out in a swarm and they have uh, scout bees, specific types of bees that will go out to try to find the new location. Um, and then they'll come back and they'll vote and they actually do democracy in this swarm. Um, and the scout bees actually can't vote until they've gone out themselves and looked at this new location and come back and said, yes, this is the place I agree um, we should do. And then once they have a quorum, once they have enough of the bees that agree on the one location, then they'll get everybody fired up, warmed up, literally vibrationally aligned. Um, and then they will take the entire swarm to this new location. And I wonder if there's parts of that that um, speak to how we might uh, enable revolution or systemic change. Hmm. Historically speaking, I guess just to respond to that, it is very interesting that the incremental change versus revolution, maybe as you said, they are not necessarily antagonistic, like incremental changes to sometimes uh, ruptures and big changes. Without incremental change, you wouldn't have the rupture in the first place. And I was thinking, and also we are really need to maybe go beyond this kind of idea of how can we change ourselves, but also think about the political ground, the political parties, this, this, which parties, which type of politics would represent us, which, which type of influences, and etc. And in order to achieve that, and I am talking, making a generalization, but most of the historical changes show us not everyone has to be on board. Big changes didn't come because everyone was on board. Usually, in most cases, actually, it was it started as a minority position, anti slave movement, feminist movement, even women, early 20th century, were against feminists, they were doing too much, they were harming, actually, women was the common opinion. So, despite so, 15 to 20 percent of the population, if they can get organized very well, they can change, lead the change. So, that's what we need to keep in mind. So, it's not about changing everyone and etc., but really organizing this 15 to 20 percent threshold group of people. And that changes the kind of the, the way they understand politics then. 
and apparently incorporating pleasure and luxury into that as well. <laughs> exactly. And uh, we need to define also what pleasure means and all, all that, what, because it is also very diverse. Sometimes people become, you know, enjoy suffering and all that stuff. And we need to talk about that, but definitely what it should be there. Emotions should be there and pleasure should be there. Absolutely. Um, so in the last few minutes, um, anyone want to raise their hand and give uh, a comment if they haven't spoken or if you have spoken and you want to sort of give your, your closing comments? Yeah, maybe I find it very interesting. We often start from the nature perspective today. We started from the cultural perspective and uh, I see it as one part of the other. There is no distinction, but they're both they are interconnected and very complex and we all come with our you know, background and understanding part of it and definitely have some reading to do, but it was extremely enriching and, and uh, I will keep thinking today about many of the parts that we have spoken and hopefully it's the beginning of the year of fire, about fire. So Ozan will come to Nara to speak again in June and Deborah also and we will have more salon. And so um, I hope we can revisit and expand on some of these thoughts and, and bring up our own little I don't want to say revolution, but uh, keep keep thinking and participating. I think that's very important to to exercise also our voices. It helps uh, evolve the thinking. I I don't have a very sophisticated vocabulary, for example, on the topic, but that's why we do it. So I want to thank all of you that put it together and help it and, and participated and spoke, et cetera, et cetera, today, this morning or this afternoon or whoever. Yeah, I also want to thank you, Rosan, for being provocative. It's very it's um it's it's good um material for me for a Sunday morning. It's very good material. Thank you so much for your thoughtful comments. Thank you. Thank you all. Absolutely. And thank you to everybody in um, in the group just for showing up, um, for being here for this conversation. Also, everybody who has made comments. Um, and uh, we just really appreciate your engagement because NAR is engagement. So just a reminder, um, the California residency is for fall, uh, the call is still open until April 10th. We will we'll also be um, putting out some information soon about the photography contest, international photography contest um, for NAR. And then um, watch this space because later this year we will have our new book um, coming out as well. Thank you so much. I will be sending out a recording of this conversation so you can watch it again and um, re re uh, digest some of that information. I know I will be. Um, and so thank you so much. We hope to see you again. This is a series this year um, around NAR and fire and the nature in our chats. So we hope that we will see you again in the future. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye everybody.